everybody to the BNI Talks webinar this week. We're talking about growing and scaling your business using the myth, the e-myth principles uh, from the classic book. And my guest is Nancy Cantor. Hello, Nancy. Hello. Uh, I've known Nancy since, uh, let's see, I became a 2003, I think. So we go way, way back in BNI. And when I started my business in 2009 or so, uh, I had no idea what I was doing. I had a one-to-one -one with Nancy and as the business consultant in the chapter, uh, I said, I don't know what I'm doing. I think I want to do this. And she was able to help me. And one of the best ways she helped was um, inviting me into this uh, class that she taught on the e-myth. Uh, I had no idea what it was. I didn't know what it meant, but it really changed the way that I looked at my business. And I think for, we've got so many uh, solopreneurs here. People are just starting out in business, maybe you were in, uh, you, like me, you might have come into BNI in a different profession and started your own business because you're surrounded by entrepreneurs and it's such a cool, exciting thing to do. So this is going to be a really great way for you to look at your business a little bit differently and I think uh, over the long term, uh, make some really good decisions for yourself. So I'm going to kind of turn it over to Nancy a little bit to get us into uh, talking about herself first and then about the book. Okay, so I've been a business development coach and consultant since 1997 and uh, here in the Massachusetts area. And I had my business, I started in 94. So I was in Arlington and I moved here, I joined BNI and that was the greatest thing I think I ever did for my business. So I did have to say that. Um, but in terms of the EMIF and business consulting, um, I started doing groups. And when I started doing groups, I looked for a concept that I felt would be really beneficial. And I found this book, The E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber. And uh, I started offering it to people in my chapter. And it was, you know, people who could be new to business like yourself, like you were thinking of starting out. But it was also, I had one person in the group who um, had been in business for 40 years and wanted to kind of relook at what he was doing and, and create the next chapter. So it's also good for businesses that you want to revitalize or maybe look at a little bit differently or have be more successful. And what I loved about it is that there was a system. I think in business systems really work. And um, I think if you can find a good system and implement it, it helps you design your business and have you be really clear about the intentions of your business and work on your business. This is the famous tagline for the EMIF, work on your business, not just in your business. So it was always my pleasure to do that. I've led many, many groups on this. And, um, and Steve, you did three of them with me and each yep. one was a process for you. You know, first to see, could I do this? You know, can I do this? Um, and then can I do this successfully? And each step along the way, I think with this system implemented, you found that you could. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, the, you know, one of the things we're going to be talking about is uh, what's great about the book is you kind of keep going back to it uh, yeah. and, and kind of uh, looking at where your business is now and how can you adjust it a little bit to get to your dream, right? So let's start quickly with a poll. Actually, there's two questions here. One, have you read the e-myth? And two, have you implemented it? If you have read it, have you implemented it into your business? Curious, curious. So we've got some people, a good number of people who have read the book, which is great. Right. But as you have said, Nancy, in the past, you've asked people, have you been implementing it into your business? And some say yes, and some say, man, not yet. Uh, and it looks like that might be the answer here. I'm gonna keep this open for about 10 more seconds. And then we'll share these results. All right. Matt's got the audio book. That's a good idea. Right. All right. Let's see what we've got. Here are our results. So not bad. So we've got 28% who have uh, already read the book and 16% uh, that have implemented uh, the teachings into their business, which is great. So the good news is if you haven't read the book before, don't worry. We're going to give you a good overview of it. Um, it's not the whole book. It's not everything, but it's everything that you need to know to at least get started or get interested uh, in this topic. Okay, we'll give you the cliff notes today. Yeah. All right. So. All right. Uh, oh, all right. Puyallup, 
Puyallup. How's that one? And Michelle, is that close? I'm, <laughs> I'm announcing a place in Washington. All right. Do you want me to share this about you know what the myth is? Yes, please. Okay. So the myth is that just because you're good at something, you can create a business doing it. And we're going to talk about there's three hats, but it's you know, they're started by technicians, people who are actually doing work, carpenters, chiropractors, um, bookkeepers, you know, they're doing the work and they could be awesome at the work, but it doesn't necessarily mean they can create a business doing it. Right. Um, and I think that, um, I think we all kind of fall into this when we start our businesses, right? Hey, I'm good at this. Why don't I just start a business? Uh, but, but then you learn, oh, wait a minute, there are other elements that I haven't thought about, right? Exactly. So I think today we can cover these three things, uh, which is setting up systems, uh, developing a life vision, and working on the business, not in it, as we talked about. Um, but there are a lot of components here that have to be working when you're looking at the, the broad view of your vision for your business, plus the actual inner workings of it as well, right? Absolutely. So these are good guideposts. Okay. So let's start with the business development process. Okay, so what I love about this book is it starts with your primary aim, where you actually look at your life. Because, you know, I've worked with businesses for a long time, and, and sometimes people create businesses that can be successful, but the businesses suck the life out of them, you know, which is not really what you want to create, I don't think. You know, it's great to have success, but or even unsuccess that sucks the life out of you. But uh -huh. you can really look at your life and what's the kind of business you want to create that would really fit the kind of life you want to have. So that's the first step that he, that he works on with people. And I've had people really write long documents about what they really want their life to look like. It's not necessarily completely simple. And they give you certain components to look at. You know, like, where do you want to live? Do you want to have that vacation home? You know, how many kids do you want to have? You know, do you want to spend time with your kids? You know, things where you actually look at your life and take it really seriously. And then the second part of strategic objective is a very clear statement about your business of what you're going to create, the kind of business you're going to create that's going to fit your primary aim. You know, it's, you know, you want to go. It's, it's about your life, not just a living so that your strategic objective really fits. How much money do you want to make in this business? Do you want to have a million dollar business or do you want to have a smaller business, you know, or a $5 million business? Those are two very different endeavors. And how does that fit your primary aim? And that's what you measure against. So the primary aim, I remember doing this in the course and I was like a deer in the headlights when this thing came at me, because I'm like, wait a minute. This is about you know me starting the business and making money and, and and really it's not is it? This is really all about what do you want the business to do and how do you want the business to serve your life? Hadn't even crossed my mind to think about that, but when you do, it just becomes this really big vision, uh, and then you can kind of get a little bit more excited about what you're doing and how you're doing things. Um, and so that's why uh, when the strategic objective comes into play, uh, then you're like, all right, I think I get this, but as a solo business owner, it's still a lot to look at. It is a lot to look at. That's why I'm saying, you know, this thing about implementing the book, actually taking the time to do, and the exercises are in the book. They're all lined up for you. You know, I always felt like my job was just to make sure people did it. You know, like that you spent the time, especially starting a business, having a business, time is of the essence. So to you know, to invest the time in doing it can seem like a big deal, but it is totally worth your time and energy. Absolutely. And, and talk about the primary aim uh, staying the same, but the strategic objective changing over time. Well, your primary aim, you know, I think if you put the time into it, I think people get a sense of themselves and what they want their life to look like. I'm not saying that would never change because it could be later on in life. I'm a little bit later on in life. So I do think my primary aim could be a little bit different, wow. but the strategic objective could change. Like you, you might change the, you know, they both could change really, you know, because that's why I would have people do the groups ongoingly because you got to a certain point in your business and you might want to look at both of these a little bit differently. It's about being insightful and conscious about what you're creating, not just creating. 
but really consciously creating that which you want that really serves you, your business, and the people that you serve. Yeah, I think there are a lot of variables in life. And I think uh, if you're looking at maybe a five-year window, you got the same primary aim. But yeah. as things change and move around, yeah, I could see how it would alter a little bit. Yeah, people have kids. People have kids that, you know, move yeah. on to college. People need to expense for college. I mean, there's definitely things in your life that come up that you want to include in your strategic objective. Right. Okay. So let's talk about the three hats. Okay, so this is a, the, a very important concept in the e-myth is saying that, you know, as one person, you actually wear three hats to kind of look at yourself that way. And it really starts out with the technician who does the work. Now, if you never go beyond the technician, that's like, you know, super busy. All you're doing is working all the time and you haven't really looked at the back end of your business. What I suggest you start with the entrepreneur and the entrepreneur is the one who sees things from the bigger picture and creates the vision. You know, the visionary, the leader kind of looking out there, you know, that looks at the primary aim and strategic objective and starts having a picture of where it could all go. And then you have the manager who actually manages things. So it happens that way so that the, the technician has work to do. But all three of those are very important. You know, I, and, you know, it's one person or it could be different people who wear those hats. Like I know I worked for a company and the person that um, was the owner of the company and he created this philosophy and it was like an educational philosophy that he was selling. He had a business manager and I worked with both of them and he would have all these big ideas and it worked really well to work with him and the business manager because all the time is coming up with big ideas and she'd have to say, if you want me to do that, I can't do this which do you really want me to do? So she would keep him straight all the time as to if we're gonna implement these and these things are gonna get managed, there's certain ways that it has to get done because the manager is very much into systems and programs and how is it actually gonna happen. The entrepreneur is very much about the future and creation. And you can see how that's very important and all that's in service of the technician who actually does the work. Yeah, I was always thrown off a little bit by the manager living in the past, but I, I understood it when you think about, well, the manager has certain systems in place that were created previously, uh, and they just want to continue everything, whereas the entrepreneur says, let's do something different, and they push things forward. And of course, the, te the technician is in the present because they've just got a pile of work on their desk that they're, they're trying to get through. Yeah, and you can see it's important to balance all three of those. All three of those, when, when they're actively working, work well together. Yeah, and I think it's hard sometimes to take off your technician hat, especially if you're busy. If you're in a busy season, how much marketing are you doing? How much thinking about you know, how you can change or make things better? You probably don't have the time for it because you're so stuck in that. That's why you have to look for those moments or schedule them in somehow uh, to make sure that the business is always moving forward. Well, you know, I think that's why coaching and being in groups is important. You know, you have an hour or two hours, you know, if you think about in a month, that's not a bad deal kind right. of thing where you actually keep that entrepreneurial vision alive because from that entrepreneurial vision, you create your plans, your projects and your plans, and then you can have accountability for you. Are you moving them forward? You know, because as a coach, I don't necessarily want to talk to the te technician. I, I really don't know a ton of, you know, carpentry, don't know a lot. Bookkeeping, you know, I mean, I know more about bookkeeping, but honestly, nobody would want to hire me as a bookkeeper. But in terms of keeping the entrepreneurial vision of the business alive, I'm awesome at. And I keep reminding them and bringing them back to the projects that they're working on and take a little piece. You know, what do you say? How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Take a little piece, get that done. We'll talk in two weeks. And two weeks is always a good period of time. And when I do my groups, we have the group session where you can bring in the content of the e -myth, but I always do private sessions with the business owners to make sure they're implementing. In two weeks, I've learned over 27 years is a good amount of time so people can get something done and you can keep moving them forward or you can catch them not doing anything and get them back into the action. But I always see that as a time to bring them into the entrepreneurial space and so the manager can get to work and support the technician having the kind of business that uh, would actually be really profitable and great for all three of them. Absolutely. All right. So let's talk about the org chart. There's another thing that 
gave me the deer in the headlights look. What? Orb chart? It's just me. Didn't you have something you were going to put on here with you? Yeah. On? So <laughs> we had, so Nancy gave us this assignment to look at all the different aspects of a business and then plug your name into you know, uh, which people in your business, because there were some people in our group that had employees and things like that. And for me, and I think for a lot of you, it probably looks a lot like this. You know, it's just me. Yep, I do that. I do that. I do that because it's just me. Uh, and so it was a lot to look at and to say, hmm, maybe I need to rethink this because there were certain things on here that were slipping because I wasn't paying attention to them because I had my technician hat on. Exactly. And so what this does is it educates you. You know, if you have distinctions, you can actually work on something. If everything's all blurred, you know, you know, you, you would rather have your technician hat on because you don't know what to look at. But if you break this down and start looking at yourself as an organization, and even if you're in all the, if you're in all the places, it's okay because each one of those places on the org chart, org chart has a different accountability. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've got your marketing person, you've got your operations person, you've got your finance person. So here's the deal. Like when something goes awry, you know who to go to, you know, and you know how to, and you start to schedule these things. And, you know, even though it's just Steve, you know, he can schedule himself as a finance manager. I know one time he came and he said, you know, I'm doing all this work. And, you know, somehow, somehow my accounts receivable is really high. And I said, well, what's your finance manager doing about that? And he goes, nothing. I said, do you schedule your finance manager? He goes, no, I haven't been. I said, well, why don't you do that? Give him an hour and see if, he's, if he invoiced all the people that owe you money. And then maybe the next hour he could follow up when he did, if he didn't receive. Next time he showed up, had no more accounts receivable. It worked pretty good. So this is right. yeah. this was the thing that I was terrible at when I started my business. I was so used to just cranking out work that that's what I was doing, and then I'm like, well, all right, I'll bill them on the weekend or something like that, which is insane, especially since I, in the beginning I wasn't making very much money. But you just kind of fall into habits, and when you see this, you're like, oh, I have to get all of this done. So it's kind of nice to have this kind of uh, almost like pinned up somewhere to to make sure you're getting everything done. Well, and I think, too, you replace yourself with a system. Yeah. So, you know, especially at the beginning, when you're in all these blocks, you want to start saying, well, what is this person accountable for? Even if it's just you, there could be another. If you create a system mm -hmm. and an accountability structure, you can put somebody else in there and be very clear about what it is you would want them to do. And that is really important. Like you think of yourself as an organization, the next thing you know, you're pretty organized as to what the accountabilities are within these different blocks that you've set up in your org chart. Right. And oh, I do want to say too, Ivan Meisner did this. You know, he he's a big fan of um, Michael Gerber. Yeah. And he did this and he was kind of distressed. He goes, oh my gosh, I mean, all these blocks. But as you can tell, slowly but surely, um, that wasn't the case anymore. But this is the beginning step. This might seem daunting, but this is the beginning step of actually creating an organization. All right. And so speaking of creating. Creating. Contacts, right? Yeah. So this is an important piece. And what, like I was saying before, when you're looking at your org chart, for each one of those blocks, you create a position contract. So what you're saying is what is, it's really a job description and what they're accountable for. But there's something about writing it down and making it very clear. And it's a contract. You sign it, you know, if you're on that block, you sign it again. I guess you could be the CEO and then you could be the person in, the, in that place. But when you bring people in, you have a position contract. It's almost like you replace yourself with a system and that is the position contract. So it's very clear what the accountability is. And, you know, and then you can point to that. Like I worked with somebody that, um, you know, she had a bookkeeping business. And so she, would, she was in the habit of coming in in the morning and talking to, you know, I'm not going to say their name, but talking to one of her employees, you know, about her week and what was going on. And the truth was that person, one of their functions and their accountability, she had a position contract, was her finance manager. And I finally said to her, I said, is that the best use of your finance manager's time? 
And she started thinking about like it kind of woke her up because she just liked talking to people and she didn't relate to her employee like, oh, this is somebody with a position contract and is accountable. And hearing him taking up a half an hour to an hour of her time chatting about something. She goes, no, that's not a good use of her time. And they really shifted that, like how they spent their time together because they looked at, you know, they thought position contract, not just person, but position contract and the system and the accountability. And it really made a difference in the business of how people organized, met with each other and spoke to each other. Like there was a level of seriousness, like, oh, we're part of an organization. And we have things that we're accountable for, not people helping out, not employees. I mean, of course, they're employees, but not just that, but really accountable for some piece within the organization. And that's how people started to operate. And that's how communications flew, you know, flew together, you know, and created to get, got created together. That made a huge difference for how the business worked. Yeah, as, um, as I was getting busier um, the past year, late 2019, uh, I started uh, handing off some some overflow work uh, to some other writers who were doing copywriting work for me, and I wanted to just I didn't want to just have them do it. I wanted them to do it in the same way that I did. And I remembered I had my position contract for it, and so I sent it to them. I'm like, this is how I want you to work. I want you to you know write it up this way, present it this way, format it like that, send it to me for approval, all that stuff. So it was right there. I didn't have to do anything; just copy and paste it into the email, and it was great, and it worked out really well. You make me so happy, Steve, so happy. I am a good student. You are, that's amazing. <laughs> All right, so you got it down, your system down, how do we make it repeatable and scale well, well, I think here's the thing, and I think you pointed to it in what you just said, is that you have the position contract, you bring somebody in, you can send them the position contract, this is how I want you to do it. And in the book, they talk about the system, there's, there's a young guy that gets hired at the hotel as a manager, and he meets with the person that owns a hotel. And he says, this is, this is our system, this is a repeatable system, you know, that the the, uh, the lights trigger the person coming into the room so the so a match gets lit and you know the fireplace goes on you know there's mints on the bed you know when they check in they tell you what coffee they like so in the morning that coffee starts brewing in the morning you know and that their favorite newspaper which they mentioned when they checked in shows up on their door in the morning so it's a system. And so this young man who's hired to manage, he doesn't have to recreate the wheel. The system's already in play. And there was a system for everything that they did. There was a system for the people who um, worked at the restaurant. There was a system for the people that uh, cleaned the rooms. So everything was written into a manual and all they did was implement the manual. So you can see, you can have people come in to do certain accountabilities where it's not like they have to create a system, they just have to follow a system. And I think that's a really good thing because you, get, you don't have to hire, you can hire at a very kind of simple level because you've, you've mapped it all out and people just have to follow the lead of what you've created. And I think that makes a difference. Also too, in terms of customers, like what if a customer came and one time it was this way that they really liked and then the next time their newspaper didn't show up or their coffee didn't start brewing. They would not like that. Customers come back because they love your system. And so if you have a system, you can satisfy your customers and you can hire people who are energetic, wonderful, and you don't necessarily care if they've been trained to the max because you've got the system that trains them. Yeah, I think that's true of, of most businesses. Like if you've gone to a really great restaurant and you go back because you had that great experience, but it's not quite the same the second time. And you're like, I don't know if I'm gonna go back to that person. But if you keep getting exactly what you got the last time, then you're, you're a customer maybe for life. And I think that's really what you're trying to generate is that you have systems and you can evolve your system. It's not like you're stuck in the system, but you can evolve your systems because the byproduct of these great systems is happy, satisfied customers that come back. And you know, at any you know, research that they do, it's so much easier to keep a happy customer than it is to generate a new one. Uh, I remember uh, you uh, worked with a landscaper who uh, was working on his business, who wound up selling his business. And so that was the, his primary aim. Why don't you talk about that? Well, it, 
I loved working with him. He was so great. So, you know, we worked a lot on developing this leadership team, you know, working on a systematic approach, but a lot was fit with his primary aim, I have to say, because he had property in Jamaica and his goal was to, um, to turn his business over. And first it was to his leadership team because he wanted to spend more time in Jamaica. So every year he spent an extra month in Jamaica. We kept building up to it. And he had a leadership team and there was somebody who he thought was going to take over the business that didn't. But in, within a very short period of time, somebody approached him who actually wanted to buy the business. So all the work that we did had in great shape to turn it over to somebody else with all the systems and the structures and the longevity of business. He ended up selling his business and now he lives you know, full time in Jamaica and he's got several projects there. And I know he travels a lot, but he... What was so great about it, he got to fulfill his primary aim and he did several of the groups just to get organized and to keep going along, you know, the lines of implementing what's in the EMF and did a great job with that. Yeah, I think it's an amazing thing to think about. All right, you've created this business that's going to sustain you uh, as you go through. But then in the end, as you're getting close to retirement time, or even if you want to try something new, to be able to sell the business that you created and then do what you want to do for your life. Yeah, I had, I had another client that um, had a moving business that he bought when he was 21 years old. And I started working with him when he was 28. And he says, I'm done. I'm sell." You know, he, he wasn't even going to sell it. He was just going to close the doors. You know, he's, he was a young guy and he'd been doing it for so long. And I said, you can't leave it till you love it. I don't know why I said that, but I made it up. I said, you can't leave it till you love it. And so we started working and implementing things. And he said, you know what I really want to do? It got, got down to like his primary aim and strategic objective. He goes, I want to work with my, my um, employees and I want to create that, you know, develop them, have them work as teams. And he was really loving it and having a great time. And miraculously, he, he got a buyer. Somebody approached him. He sold, he, it was a moving and storage business. He sold it. And that allowed him to take three years off. He took three years off to really get with his family. He supported his younger brother in getting through college and he developed his next business, which was completely different than what he had and was really successful, moved to Ithaca, got married, had a baby. I mean, it was, I mean, I'm very life oriented. You know, if people can fulfill their primary aim, I'm so happy, you know? And I think if you've got your primary aim, you create the strategic objective to really fulfill on that. This guy created the life he truly wanted, and he had the money from the sale of the business, which he never would have happened if he just left it. Right. So I, I do a lot of work with that. You know, you kind of have to resurrect the enthusiasm sometimes, but be guided in the right direction so you really can fulfill on what you intend. Yeah, I know. I mean, I remember I just wanted to start taking some vacation time uh, because, you know, I work for BNI, I work in my business, and it's like I'm never off. Uh, and and making those changes uh, allowed me to relax a little and travel a little bit more and, and do the things that I wanted to do. So uh, thank you for that, Nancy. Totally welcome. Um, all right, so let's jump into Q&A here. Um, I think we, yeah, there we go. Um, let's see, so Lisa says, as a solopreneur, should the position contract include how many hours each position should be working in the position each week or month? Well, I think it really depends on is that important because like there's some people who can do stuff really fast and some people that can't, but I think you have to look at it like how does it best serve the business, you know, it depends, you know, I think you want to be what's going to give the guidelines that you really want for that particular person. I mean, some people need to know I'm expecting to work 10 hours a week or you have to be in nine to five because I know that can be an issue. Like, you know, somebody who owns a business, they have an employee coming in and they don't have a regular schedule. I know I have an, a, a client right now. That's a big issue. So part of the position contract should be, you know, you need to be in here every day from nine to three or four to nine or, you know, whatever is a specific thing. It comes down to you because you're setting the guidelines. You want them to be accountable and you want it to fit the needs that you have for the business. Because sometimes if you're too loose, people you know, don't do what you want. And then it's hard to rein them back in a little bit. All right. Uh, here's a question from Andy Burgoyne, who we both know. Uh, he says, uh, I'm not an entrepreneur, even though I have that mindset. Uh, what are your thoughts on applying these lessons in the corporate environment, starting with a middle manager 
pitching to senior management? I think it's totally a great idea. I think everybody these days has to think entrepreneurially and anything that gives you guidance on how to do that. A lot of the work that I do, I have done in corporations like larger, cor you know, I did a two year project at Fidelity applying entrepreneurial thinking. And it works really great because people are people and you get people in a structure, a system and communicating together. It is amazing what can happen. I would totally, I'd love to talk to you about that because I think it works very, very well. All right. Um, here's one from Christina. What are some of the things that you look at first when you analyze a business's current systems? Um, she says she has a hard time getting other business owners to understand the importance of a consistent system, recognizing the long-term value. So I'm not quite, I don't know that I completely so, understand that question. Yeah, just going back to the, the first part of it, what are some of the things that you look at first when you analyze a business's current systems? Well, I think you need to look at what they, I, I think if you follow the system, it will sort itself out. You know, I think you start at the beginning with primary aim, strategic objective, you do your org chart, and then you start to look to see how does that map on to where things are right now. I think that's a bigger question than I'd be happy to talk to you about, you know, where then you start looking more deeply as to what's actually going on. But start with the system and map that on. And then from there, I think you can have some insight as to how are your systems working or, you know, or possibly not working. Yeah, I agree. When you use this model, it really does make you uh, look at the business uh, on a deeper level mm -hmm. uh, and in a way that uh, you'll have to implement things or add new things or take away things that aren't working so that you can get to that point and, and factoring your primary aim. And if none of that is in your purview at this time, it's going to be kind of a revelation to go through this book and see how your business can change. Yeah. And I think sometimes you don't know what you don't know. So when you get yourself into a process like this, you start having insights that you didn't have before. And once you have insights, then you can grow and develop into them. You know, it gets you moving and shaking and going, hmm. It gets a little bit more interesting rather than just frustrating and trying to fix things. It's more comes from a more positive place of creating something. All right. So uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, the importance of using the book and just kind of wrapping us up for today. Okay. So I have to say, I've read this book many times. And every time I read this book, I get something new. And I, you know, I've had people do, you know, I led it as, you know, the groups in the private coaching that did three or four groups with me. And they continue to implement this material. It takes a bit to do it. You know, it's not the easiest thing on the planet. You know, if you look at the poll, um, you know, people have read it and I've heard a lot from people, oh, I love it. I think it's really great. And then I say, what have you implemented? And they go, it's kind of a little bit of a pause. I'm like, well, I don't know, not nothing really. <laughs> I go, okay. So I think, you know, what I would say is read the book, you know, you can get it on audio and, you know, I, this is what I do. I love to work with groups of people. I love to work with individuals about how you implement it so that it makes a difference in your business. And I guarantee you, you know, this thing about working on your business and not just in your business is very important because we want to develop businesses that really serve us and serve the people that uh, who are our customers and our clients. 